Dubai. We are ready to roll. Thank you everyone for joining the Retina Consultants of Texas RCTX, the Zoom CME. The big topic of tonight, the big central theme will be urgent slash emergent. How do you know? When do you send them? Do you send them tomorrow? Do you send them in five weeks? Do you send them in an hour? We will tell you um, and try and get to the bottom of things. So that's sort of the bigger, bigger picture theme here. And All right, a couple of housekeeping things. So here are all the retina consultants of Texas doctors. Pretty much everyone is on the call tonight. I think Dr. Fish is not and Dr. Benz, but every other beautiful face you see is on here. So please, we urge you any questions you have whatsoever. There's a chat box. They, the people who are not giving, actually giving the talk immediately will answer your questions ASAP and perhaps pose some new ones uh, for you. So do not be shy about asking questions. Uh, the retina, this is a little bit about the Greater Retina, Greater Houston Retina Research Foundation. It's a 501c3. Uh, this is a nonprofit organization. And this organization serves to promote retina health, macular health. It is a separate financial entity than the clinical aspects of Retina Consults of Texas. Um, and this is where our research, and this is the sponsor um, of your meeting tonight. Locations throughout. So Many of you know we have basically throw a dart at a map of Greater Houston, you're gonna hit one of our locations. The ones I really wanna highlight are twofold. One, the new Pearland office, which is 288, just outside of Beltway 8. Easy to get to right off 288. And then very, very new as of a week or two ago is our brand new flagship Retina Consultants of Texas Bel Air office. It is beautiful, 16,000 foot square floor basically on the corner of Newcastle and Bissonette, just right on the West U border, just into Bel Air, right where 59 comes into 610 near Episcopal High School, if many of you know where that is. It is a wonderful office with all the new technology, giant research center, clinical space for everyone. We frequently have three doctors there. Um, and we are very excited about the opening of this job. It is swanky, it is new and it is great for patient care. They park in a parking lot. They don't pay like they do in the med center, walk straight across so it's an easy in and out. Of note, speaking of the Texas Medical Center office, we have our Skirlock office that we've long had on Skirlock 750 in the heart of the medical center and we will maintain that office as well. So this is a new office in addition to that Texas Medical Center office and they're really somewhat close together. So excited about that. And there's, here's a picture of it. So there you can see the doctors that come to this new flagship research center and Retina Consultants of Texas flagship office. Again, it's on the corner of Bissonette Newcastle and Bissonette, almost in the corner where 610 and 59 together. So easy access to 59, easy access to 610, and easy access from patients coming from the north or from the west as well. So, and Dr. Fish and Dr. Scheffler, also of note, will continue to see patients uh, at the Texas Medical Center office at our older location uh, in Skirlock. So this is brand spanking new, and we're very excited about it, as well as a research department, which is housed there, which is also wonderful. A lot of room, a lot of space. You've heard me say it several times, Retina Consultants of Texas, not the old Retina Consultants of Houston. That is our new name, RCTX. New name, same exceptional care. We chose with, a, we decided with the new office and sort of uh, to go in a new direction logo wise and uh, in additions to the group. So we have, we are now Retina Consultants of Texas. I think you'll love our new logo, sort of pupil-y with a little sort of Amsler grid, a little sort of Amsler kind of a look, maybe an Ishihara color plate kind of a look with a pupil and a Texas star. We're proud of it. And we're proud to be the new Retina Consultants of Houston. So what changes? Absolutely nothing. It's a name change and a logo change, but referring of patients, if you have the old forms, you can use those. If you have the new forms that Sarah Bombertano uh, will get to you, Fine, nothing changes on your end, same patient care, just different name and different logo that we're, we're excited about. Um, and I'm also very excited about Dr. Kelly Larkin. We welcome her to Retina Consultants of Texas. She is an immunology and uveitis specialist, uh, and she will be full-time Monday through Thursday, I believe, at our Bel Air office. So she is there every day. Um, she was uh, a Houston, originally trained in Houston, sort of born and bred in the Woodlands. I believe she's a a Highlander from Woodlands High School. She then trained at UT Houston for both medical school and residency, and also Casey uh, fellowship at the Casey Institute, which is a fantastic program in Oregon. And again, her specialty is ocular immunology and uveitis, and she sees patients full times um, in 
our new flagship office in Bel Air. Dr. Larkin, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Welcome to Retina Consultants of Texas. And give us a little bit about yourself that I didn't give you besides the Highlander part. <laughs> I am indeed a Highlander. You got that part right. Um, let's see. Well, I went to undergrad at Texas A&M, a major in biology with a minor in music, spent my freshman year at actually University of Houston as a music major. Um, and, um, you know, I've been in Houston ever since, except for that year I spent in Portland doing my fellowship. And as Dr. Brown pointed out, I'm actually at the Newcastle location Monday through Friday, every day. Thank you. I'm very, very excited to be here. We're excited to have you, Kelly. Thank you so much. And we look forward to working with you for a long time and Monday through Friday, every day, uh, at that new belly, at that new fantastic Bel Air office. That's right. All right. Thanks, guys. So our other new old retina specialists that we have that many of you have seen in, in previous seas are Dr. Patel and Dr. Wynn. They are uh, Dr. Patel uh, is at the Woodlands in Kingwood, Northwest. He's sort of the king of the north, the north side of town. Also Livingston and Lufkin. Dr. Wynn goes to Pearland. Uh, she believes she goes to Memorial. She also goes to uh, our main on Mondays with me at our main uh, Bel Air, new Bel Air office. So welcome Dr. Wynn and Dr. Patel, and you'll hear from Dr. Patel a little bit later um, on in this, in this lecture. Uh, you've heard us mention it before, but uh, Retina Consultants of Texas, RCTX is the image portal. All you need to do, and Sarah Barbatano can help you with this if need be, you sign up on that website, you complete a very short, very quick form, and confirm your email login, and what's nice about it is this enables us to send and receive HIPAA compliant uh, pictures and text. So you have a patient, you say, you know, I'm not sure, like you'll see today, is this a horseshoe retinal tear? Is it a detachment? I'm not sure what's going on here. I'd like to refer this patient to you and here's, here's where they are. It really facilitates communication uh, between referring doctors and us. And it is again, HIPAA compliant. It's very e easily done. And you get great color images, not the weird black and white, you know, old school onion paper fax machine uh, pictures that we used to get. That is a thing of the past. So sign up, the Retina Consultants of Texas image portal, and we can send images back and forth and really facilitate uh, more excellent patient care. Easy to do, and when in doubt, Sarah Barbatano can help you with this, and her email will be at the end of this talk. Okay, let's get it started. So that's a little bit of housekeeping. I will go first, and here's a patient that comes in. They come in and they say, I'm 61 years old, I've got flashes and the floaters. You get an OCT, and you get, you see the posterior vicious attachment, and you get an optose wide field imaging map that you have in your office. And you see this and you say, well, I think they've had a posterior vitreous detachment and that black stuff's in the middle and they're complaining about a floater. I'm not sure if there's some blood back there, vitreous hemorrhage. And when you look a little wider, you see something. If you look about probably 830 or 9 o'clock, you see what looks to be maybe a little hemorrhage dot and maybe maybe a tear next to it. Some, maybe some white without pressure. You don't know really. So this is a very common occurrence and essentially uh, something that we see every day. So this patient looks like they do have a little vitreous hemorrhage with a posterior vitreous attachment. And then, you know, when, when referred, we would probably scleral depress this patient and look out there. It looks like it could be a tear, maybe, maybe not. But anyway, we can get after it with some scleral depression. There's a hemorrhage dot and maybe there's a small little uh, hem uh, tear underneath it. Uh, so this is something that we like to look at and warrants a referral. So let's talk about PVD a little bit, a little bit more about it. Uh, it's a common thing. We see it all the time, posterior bridge attachment. They're going to complain of flashes and floaters. Remember, there's no pain. You'll have pigment cells or what is called tobacco dust. Or um, if you look in the ant, just on the slit lamp, look just through the lens, look into the anterior vitreous, and perhaps you'll see some little pigment spots. Uh, so as Dr. Brown calls it, there's a Weiss ring there a, or a Volks ring, as he calls it. It's a glial cell proliferation. Imagine you tore a wallpaper off a wall and you have your light switch there where the light switch is not, with a, uh, in other words, the optic nerve is, you get a little glial ring that will frequently stay for a, lot of, uh, a long time. So that's what they complain of. Normal vitreous features, so we'll talk about a PVD a little bit and how it happens and sort of why you get certain tears. Remember, it's, it's not uniformly attached. It's attached more firmly at the base, the nerve head margin, the lens, which concerns a little bit less, and along major vessels. So two things, 
if you look at the vitreous base, it straddles the aura serrata. So the pars plana is where we like to do injections. So we, when you stick a needle in somebody's eye and measure, you know, 3.5 or four millimeters back from the limbus, we want to be just behind their lens, but we want to be just in front of the aura serrata. We don't want to puncture retina. So that vitreous base is attached a little bit in front of the aura serrata, anterior to it, a little bit posterior to it. And that's going to be important because when you actually have a posterior vitreous attachment, I think I have a little movie of it. Well, that's now. Uh, let's see. Movie's coming. Average age, 60, 65, 65-ish or so, increases with things that move that number forward. Longer, skinny eye, myopic eye. Age, of course, we talked about that. Being aphakia gives you an earlier posterior vitreous attachment trauma, uveitis, or other inflammatory disease, and then myopia, which is sort of goes along with a increased axial length. You also have, there's an acute PVD, a Voigt ring for Dr. Brown or a Weiss ring for the rest of us. And there's some tobacco dust or Schaefer's sign in the anterior vitreous. All right, let me get, let me see. All right, here we go. Let me see if I can get this. Uh, see if this rolls. So here, this is a video of the vitreous is attached here. And we saw the vitreous base earlier. And I'm going to show you how it attaches because it makes sense on making a tear. Imagine here it goes contracting, starting from the back and sort of rolling forward anteriorly almost to the, the, the most posterior aspect of the posterior aspect, excuse me, of the vitreous base. So we'll see why that's important. Well, if I have a PVD, a push your attachment. You see the Weiss ring. You've seen it on your, on your optos. You want to know, well, are they going to have a tear, right? That's what's, what you're ultimately looking for. If they, and here's a big number to know. If they have a hemorrhage, push your attachment with hemorrhage, about two thirds, about 66% or so will have a tear. If they don't have hemorrhage, it's more like 3%. So big difference. If your hemorrhage is a very, very telltale sign. If you see a little bit of hemorrhage, they probably have a tear. If you don't see a hemorrhage, they're less likely to as well. So I'm going to throw this out to Charlie Wyckoff. Dr. Wyckoff, are you there? We're ready. I'm going to, I'm going to pre -op, I'm going to prep you with this is a little bit of a trick question, but why is a tear horseshoe shaped frequently? Well, I may be the wrong person to answer this because I wasn't born in Texas. <laughs> but I did get here as yes. fast as I could, and I'm never looking back. He knows where it's going. Dr. Brown, this is for you, too. So, Dr. Brown knows why a tear is horseshoe shaped. It's because we live in the great state of Texas. Bam. There you go. Oh, look at that nice longhorn, Dr. Brown. So. And it, wanna, it wants to walk to the macula. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want that bull in my macula. All right. Here's the rear. Here's the reason. The reason is we saw the little movie. We saw the post. We saw the uh, posterior hyaloid face. We saw the the vitreous contracting. Well, imagine it rolls up, and there's your here is your aura serrata, right? So the vitreous base straddles it, but it came right up to the posterior end. So you can imagine the base of the tear, the base of the horseshoe, so to speak, is usually where the PVD stops, and the flap is where it's actually picked it up, rolled past it and curled it up and given it a, a nice lift. There's a bridging vessel at the bottom, so that's why they are horseshoe taped, the horseshoe shaped, excuse me, is because of the way the posterior vitreous attachment rolls up and really stops its a detachment, the vitreous anyway, at really the posterior aspect of the vitreous base. When your vitreous pulls off, the anterior part of the vit vitreous base in front of the orserata doesn't typically roll off unless you're punched by a boxer or something like that. So why do we care about tears? Because they lead to detachments, right? And so anybody in terms of having a tear, having a detachment, uh, we like to see those people as soon as possible. You know, if those people have flashes and floaters and it's in the middle of the night, they can wait till first thing in the morning. Frequently, um, a lot of times if they do need to go to surgery, we make them NPO just in case. So when they come in in the morning, it's nice not that they had a big breakfast or stopped at Whataburger to eat just in case they need to go. That facilitates us. So we frequently tell them that. Uh, but we frequently uh, would like to see them, you know, next morning or as soon as possible, or at least through the image portal, send us a picture and we can sort of guide you on what the best office would be closest and, and what time and place to see them. Uh, management of retinal attachments is a different topic, but we are frequently managed with a scleral buckle, A, 
B, a vitrectomy, or a combination of the two, a scleral buccal and vitrectomy. And I'll leave it to the chat line, but I'll throw out a little question here and see if you can get it. So if you look at the bottom right picture, here's a retinal attachment and a repaired retinal attachment. And you see this person looks like they have a scleral buccal. See this ridge temporally? You can see it with laser around the edge. Somebody from the chat who's not an art retina consultant of Texas person, please, tell me what this scar is or what this sort of hypopigmented area that's just north of the nerve. If you look superior to the optic nerve here, there's a little scar maybe or a hypopigmented area. Someone throw that out and tell me what that is or what they think that is. And then RCTXers answer that question, please. Because it's tricky and you see it a lot. So it's a, again, this is a patient that's had surgery. They've had a vitrectomy and they've had a scleral buckle. That's a clue, a tip. So it look. Like Dr. Matthew already got it. All right, Dr. Matthew, very solid. Did he, did he get it? I, I don't have the chat in front of me. So what that is, did you, did you all answer it? Mm. And Dr. Farhani, yeah, retinotomy scar. That we got, we got a couple correct answers. Very nice. That is a draining retinotomy or retinotomy scar. So frequently the surgeon will make that to drain subretinal fluid out of it, maybe give it a little laser. So that is made by the surgeon during the time of surgery to help flatten that retina down and suck some fluid out of there and maybe give it later. So it's essentially a scar. And it's usually made off in the periphery, hopefully. So obviously you're not going to see one of those in the macula. We don't put it there. So your patient walks in. He says, Dr. Smith, Dr. Jones, I'm ready for cataract surgery. My friend had it and they ended up with a retinal detachment. What is going on? What is my risk? I wasn't scared before, but now I am. So what's going on? So what are risk factors for sort of cataract surgery in terms of having um, a retinal detachment? So pseudophagic retinal detachment. Uncomplicated phaco, everything goes well, everything goes perfect. It's on the order of 1%. What you think about it is pretty high. So 1% of all uncomplicated phaco patients will have a retinal detachment. That number goes up or is about the same, roughly 1% after YAG capsulotomy. They frequently get, you know, six months or whatever it is a year later because you're stirring the pot of the vitreous. What about, you know, the cataract surgery this time wasn't so uncomplicated, but rather it was complicated and there was a bag rupture. There was a rupture of the posterior capsule, perhaps with anterior vitreous that came forward. Now you're talking along more like 5%. So it's jumping up. Well, not only did anterior vitreous come forward, but a bunch of pieces of lens, uh, native crystal lens fell in the back. They have retained lens fragments. Maybe they need a vitrectomy. Now you're talking 15%. And then throw in those people with really high myopia, like the minus 10s, the minus 12s, the minus 15, and their number goes even higher than that. So those are sort of your order of things to look out for um, when a patient comes in for pseudophagic retinal detachments and the risk factors. Post-op retinal complications, we sort of talked about it, but again, vitreous prolapse is a big one. Uh, it, looking for pre-existing lattice. A lot of times they'll say, hey, you know, I had my, I had a retinal detachment and Dr. Patel fixed it. Well, I have lattice in my other eye. Now he wants to laser the other eye, which we frequently will do. So a lot of times we will laser pre-existing lattice, especially if they have a lot of it in a patient who's already had a retinal attachment because it is a risk factor, especially maybe they're going to have cataract surgery. So it's always nice to see those patients with a lot of lattice and to follow them. They frequently develop, will develop little holes or tears that will laser demarcate in clinic. Um, because it's worrisome for them and worrisome for us, especially given the history of a retinal attachment in the contralateral eye. And again, usually these events typically occur in the six month period after uh, cataract surgery, even if it is uncomplicated. So, all right, case number one. This is a 60 year old male, cataract in the left eye. Surgery, no problem. Cataract smooth, silky. Uh, the post-op period, vision is great, looks great, and improves over several weeks. Then, you know, then uh, subsequent months, their vision starts to decline, and you look at them and you say, yeah, they've got a posterior capsular opacification. Let's uh, yag that off. They have a yag. There's your yag. But their vision's still bad. So here's a picture, and it's sort of a hazy you know, picture even through that now open capsule of the central macula. You do a dilated fundus exam, but it's hard to see in the periphery because they don't dilate well and your, your optos is broken. 
So you say, oh, I think they have some macular cysts there. Maybe, maybe they have Irving gas. That's common. I'll start them on Pred Forte or Brom Day, but that doesn't help either. OCT time. OCT. Looks like that. Anybody, what has happened here? Anybody venture a guess? Is that Irving gas syndrome? They do have some intraretinal fluid here, a little CME right here in the retina. Got a little more than that. Got a little more than that. Uh, Got a little more than that. Dr. Brown wants to explore further. <laughs> How about a picture? Something you get every day all the time. Bam. So this person has a retinal detachment. So what the point of this is retinal detachments are frequently, and they can even be somewhat asymptomatic, frequently found after YAGs, after, after cataract surgery. And a lot of times they go undetected. So a good wide field picture and a, and a, a dilated exam with scleral depression is needed, uh, especially if they're symptomatic. So this person had a tear inferiorly. They have a sort of a retinal attachment from about three to seven o'clock with subretinal fluid, which is what you see on the OCT. And this patient, um, we really manage retinal attachments, sometimes with barricade laser, sometimes with cryo and a pneumatic retinopexy, whereby in the office, they're sitting in the chair, they get their hole frozen in their retina, they get a gas bubble put in their eye and they position a certain way. And then both, as mentioned earlier, with scleral, scleral buckles and vitrectomies and buccal and vitrectomies with gas or oil. And again, those are surgical indications. Those are surgical procedures, but the pneumatic retinopexy is done in the chair and the lasers are done in the chair. Different topics. So this, we're talking about, ret so any questions about retinal attachments, pop them up in the chat, chat them up. Okay, Charlie, I'm going back to you. It's a hazy picture. So we're talking about retinal attachments, but we're gonna switch gears a little bit we're going from maybe first gear to second gear or third gear, okay? So not necessarily regimentologist attachments, but this you get this picture and you say, hey, photographer, come on, it's hazy. What's going on here? It's a new patient. Maybe they have some scattered PRP laser, you don't even know. They've got a hazy picture and they've got some white stuff out here. What is going on here? And they've had their cataract surgery. They already had that. Their vision's not better. What's going on, Charlie? Thank goodness they had cataract surgery because they have a big retina problem now. And Dr. Yeah. Matthew in the chat looks like they just got it, which is a big TRD. So that white stuff is very likely fibrovascular proliferation that comes on with proliferative diabetic retinopathy in that classic napkin ring pattern that's sort of encircling the fovea. And it's amazing how people can have sometimes remarkably good vision in that sort of pit of the fovea. Um, in the middle of that TRD. But it sounds like this patient's already got vision loss. And this is a challenging situation because the, 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 these eyes are really challenging to manage. Much, much rather see these eyes earlier in the disease course. It, yes, early is the key. This is a person with proliferative, as Charlie mentioned, proliferative diabetic retinopathy with a, a nasty tractional retinal attachment, different kind of retinal attachment uh, that's causing tractional attachment in sort of a jawbone, wolf's uh, mandible bone around the, the, the fovea. Remarkably, a lot of times they can have fairly good vision until they get a vitreous hemorrhage because their fovea is fairly intact. But when you get an FA, which we'd like to do, you frequently, when you look at the central FA, it doesn't look so bad. Doppler hemorrhage is MAs. But in the periphery, heavy, heavy ischemia, neovascularization elsewhere. So this person needs a combination of panretinal photocoagulation, laser, um, injections, maybe even we operate on tractional retinal attachments and peel off those membranes and give them endolaser panretinal photocoagulation during the time of surgery. So early is the key. We want to see these patients early. We want to treat them early. We want to follow them closely. So I'd rather see a diabetic and say, you know what, Mrs. Johnson, you've got mild non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy on a scale of one through 10. Your diabetes is a one. I'll see you later and we'll, and we'll follow you and keep you than opposed to patients like I had today that are hand motion both eyes, they're 30 years old and they have terrible tractional retinal attachments. Okay, last couple of things, it's gonna be rapid fire and then James Calder Major is done. All right, Dr. Chin, are you there? I am here. All right, Dr. Chin, this is for you, rapid fire. 45 year old asymptomatic female found on routine exam. I took a close up of the optos picture out in the periphery. I see what might be a retinal attachment. And she says, I want LASIK, is that okay? 
Uh, I think in this situation, it looks okay. It looks like white without pressure. It is white without pressure. When would you, when do you want to see this patient? If you saw this patient and they had white without pressure and you were pretty confident about it on your, on one of the image portal images that was sent to you and you didn't see other break or tear, what would you like to do? Um, I mean, if this is a patient I saw in the office, you know, and we verified it is white with the pressure, we probably wouldn't need to see it back. Um, if there's anything concerning of anything else, any other peripheral pathology or ascesis or anything like that, then obviously we would want to check that back. Good. White without pressure, not concerning. However, white without pressure can be very deceiving. Look like a tear, look like a break. When in doubt, we're always happy to look at it. Okay. Dr. Scheffler, are you there? I'm here. All right. You are rapid fire number two, 76 year old female with flash and floaters, uncomplicated cataract surgery. You look around, you do a dilated frontex exam, you do some depression, you get a big optos picture. Everything looks wonderful except a close up of what I took here in the periphery. She says, I'm scared. I have an increased risk of RD. Tell us more, Dr. Scheffler. So this looks like cobblestone degeneration. And the good news for this patient is that she does not have an increased risk of detachment um, with cataract surgery, without cataract surgery. And some studies actually show that these patients have a decreased risk of detachment. Oh, she's going to like that news very much. All right. Yes. So Mrs. Jones, goodbye. We will see you later. This is no risk. Dr. Shuffler is perhaps a little less. She's happy. Moving on. Okay. Dr. Brown, are you there? I am here. All right, this is a little bit of a hazy picture. So there's, this is a young 28-year-old post-LASIK female, okay? So yeah, that, that looks like a pre-retinal hemorrhage, a boat hemorrhage maybe. Yes, he sees a little pre-retinal hemorrhage. 30% chance of a tear. Better be looking. He's looking around now. He's dilating. He's put poking and prodding if he needs to. Do and an RNFL. If you do an RNFL, you can see if they have a PVD of the nerve. Nice. Not, not published yet. We're about to publish it, but I think it's the easiest way to see a PVD. Anyway, look for that tear. Fantastic. Urgent. Send them. We want to see this. This is this is dangerous. Okay. Last one. Uh, Dr. Dr. Patel, are you there? I am. Okay. Slow decline in vision. They think, but they've never seen a doctor. And they're, you know, 55 years old. Of course they haven't seen a doctor. Right. And they're not sure how long their vision's been bad. What do you think about all the blood and all this? Yeah. So, I mean, it looks like a, from here, at least it looks like a massive subretinal hemorrhage. Um, you'd be worried about a lot of stuff. I definitely want to see this person pretty, pretty urgently. Um, maybe even emergently that day. Um, differential is large, but you could think, you know, it could be like polypoidal. It could be, a, there could be a mass under that. It could be a number of things. They have um, diabetes, and they when you when you check their blood sugar, it's five hundred and eighty four. Oh man! So it's probably due to diabetic retinopathy. They just got these big pre retinal hemes, uh, maybe even some subretinal hemes from NV or something. And then peripherally, you see all those hemorrhages too. Again, this is a patient that was caught a little too late, but salvageable. This patient can get injections, as both Dr. Brown and Dr. Wyckoff has shown. Giving them injection not only decreases their edema, which we give it for all the time but it also decreases their diabetic retinopathy severity scale. In other words, this so patient- They need to go to the emergency room or their doctor, not to me with that 500 plus blood sugar, by the way. Right, well, that was, yeah. Oh, <laughs> but they're sitting in your chair now. Give them an injection and then send them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I think the rapid fire. Oh, I got one more rapid fire. 66 year old, Dr. Kim, are you there? I am right here, yes. Okay, Dr. Kim, excellent. This is a 66-year-old neighbor of yours with new flashes and floaters. They're watching the Astros, no big deal, sitting on the sofa, bam. All of a sudden, it came on like that. What do you got here, and what do you want to do, and when do you want to see them? Yes, looks like there's a tear with a, um, is, is this a bridging vessel? Looks like there's a blood vessel there and a tear, so with a little bit of uh, subretinal fluid around it. So I would want to treat this patient um, within a day or two. Good. Yeah, Dr. Kim's going to jump all over this. They're lucky not to have this bridging vessel ruptured, but she's right. There might be subretinal fluid here, a tear. Um, so it could be cryoed, could be retinal attached with laser, could be just laser itself. But this is a patient we definitely want to see because this is danger bill, I think. 
Yes, but after the Astros game, he can finish the Astros game. If they go into extra innings, he can watch. <laughs> um, okay, that is I am done with retinal detachments, both of the plifford die regular retinopathy, TRD type, but, but um, also flashes, floaters. I will turn it over to Dr. Um, Sagar Patel. Sagar, are you there and ready to go? I am. Uh, let me set okay. it up here. All right, there we go. Okay, um, let me start by saying I hope everyone's got good power, water, everyone's uh, houses is okay. Um, finally, we're kind of getting back to normal here. Um, wish everyone well. So as, as Dr. Major said, my name is Sagar Patel. I joined pretty recently. Um, it's been about six, seven months, um, and I'm going to be talking about endophthalmitis. So specifically, I'm going to focus on a acute postoperative endophthalmitis, which we may see after cataract surgery. Um, so for this, you're going to think uh, typically it's going to be after, you know, three to five days is a normal window after uh, intraocular surgery. After cataract surgery, this the range is sort of debated, but most recent large studies show maybe a 0.03 to 0.04% chance of getting it after a routine cataract surgery. Um, they have noticed that since clear corneal incisions came about, uh, the rate slightly increased, and that may be because of, you know, these are thought to be self-healing wounds that may not indeed actually be so self-healing. Um, and then typically it's gonna be rapidly progressive. Most common finding is gonna be actually blurred vision, followed by redness, followed by pain. You actually have to keep in mind that 26% of people with this won't actually have pain. Um, and then swollen eyelid is the most, uh, fourth most common sign. This is kind of what you're gonna be seeing here. Um, this patient, uh, so you're going to have decreased visual acuity, lid swelling, conge edema, corneal edema. And when you look in the AC, you're going to see fibrin and you'll see a hypopion. Um, the hypopion and the fibrin, about 85% in um, post-operative and I'll end up with my to see this. Vitreous inflammation, retinitis, hazy media. Um, here you can see uh, the cornea is pretty edematous in this photo. This patient still has their lens. Um, it looks like it may be perturbed though, a little dislocated potentially. And then inferiorly, you can see that layering um, of white material, which would be that hypopion. Um, so you're gonna really suspect this in any eye that has more inflammation greater than the post-operative core. So if you get a patient that, you know, had cataract surgery elsewhere and calls in a couple of days later, and says like, doc, my eye really hurts. Um, you wanna have a high threshold to make sure, you know, it's not, I mean, it could be it could be something as simple as an abrasion, or you know, um, maybe just some AC cell after the surgery. But you want to make sure that they don't really have something else going on. Um, there's other sort of surgeries too, like uh, if they've had a PK, you want to check to make sure that there's no uh, scleral. Uh, I'm sorry, no suture abscess or something that's present. Also, want to do a thorough exam, make sure that the wound itself is not leaking. You know, if you see, uh, sometimes you can even see AC fluid draining from there. Um, and then you want to take a good look at the IOL itself um, and the, the, uh, the pupil to make sure there's no, uh, if there's vitreous incarceration, um, you'll see a sort of peaking in the pupil. Um, if they had a um, secondary IOL placed, you can sometimes even see that the, the sutures used to fixate that are eroding or even the IOL haptics itself have kind of eroded through the conge. When a patient like this comes in, you do have to still, you know, think about other things. So your differential here is really going to be one: do they have a retained lens fragment that's causing a lot of inflammation? Um, you know, if they had a little nuclear fragment that fell back or something, some sometimes they can have a pretty uh, severe inflammatory response. Then you're going to also think of, you know, if it's if it is a little abnormal, you want to be thinking of like infectious causes, uh, non-infectious uveitis syphilis, TB, VKH, that kind of stuff. Um, there's also rare cases of non-infectious endophthalmitis, and that would be, you know, um, that would be like an inflammatory reaction to an intravitreal drug. Some cataract surgeons, uh, after the surgery, they do inject uh, antibiotics and sometimes a steroid intracamerally and sometimes actually even intravitreally. Um, you want to kind of keep an eye out for that. There's actually a large series in Dallas of... Um, uh, acute, we call it posterior, uh, acute toxic posterior segment syndrome, where they, they had these um, intracameral injections of medicines and they were contaminated. Large series patients went blind after this, came in, you know, severely decreased vision. So you want to watch out for it, for that kind of stuff. Um, could be ARN, 
Also, another similar thing is called toxic, toxic anterior segment syndrome. This is a little confusing because it also happens right after the cataract surgery, um, severe inflammatory reaction, but it's not infectious. It's really, it's thought to be that maybe one of the instruments you had had, had some cleaning chemical on it or some, something is introduced into the eye that introduces a really severe inflammatory reaction. The difference is that this is going to happen a little quicker. So uh, 12 to 24 hours. ILP typically will be increased. And when you do a culture, you're going to find that it's negative. Um, and then intraocular lymphoma can also present with sort of similar findings. So when you see this patient, you know, this is definitely an emergency. Um, you want to do an exam. You want to check an ultrasound because a lot of times you really can't see the retina so well. Um, you're looking for vitritis mainly. You're looking for toroidal thickening. You're also trying to see what the retina looks like. Um, make sure there's no retinal detachment underlying all this detritus that you can't see. Um, look for, a, you know, some sort of foreign body, a lens material that's, that's in, you know, floating around in there. Uh, and then you're going to go ahead and proceed. Um, typically, you're, the next step is going to be a vitreous tap. And if you can't get anything, then you'll, you'll do an AC tap. Um, and then the, the sort of characteristics here of the microbial um, flora that you find. So bacteria are most common. Um, typically, it's thought that it actually it's from the patient's own flora. Um, so periocular flora, bugs that live on the eyelids, the skin around the eyelids, eyelashes, is typically what causes this. Um, there's a large study that was done um, a while back called the endoph uh, endophthalmitis uh, vitrectomy study. Um, and they had a... It was, it was kind of a groundbreaking study where they compared vitrectomy to intravitreal antibiotics. Um, but they basically found that in 30% of cases of this, uh, they were culture negative. Staph epi was the most common organism found at about 70%. And then there's a slew of other species that as well that, that sometimes can be found. The treatment really, uh, there's two ways to go with this. One, um, option is really to do a tap and inject. So that would be done in clinic. You would take some of the fluid out, either of the vitreous or the anterior chamber, send it for analysis, and then uh, inject antibiotics. Um, the other option is gonna be an immediate PPV. So an immediate vitrectomy, send the sample out for study, and, and then also inject the antibiotics at the end. The um, EVS study really kind of helps stratify what you do in, in most cases. Um, and they found that if your LP, you have a greater chance of 2040 vision after an immediate PPV rather than immediate tap and inject. Um, the difficulty here is sometimes access to, to ORs um, and that kind of, you know, so sometimes the tap and inject is, is done initially and you kind of assess the response after that. Um, and they, in this study, they did find if their hand motion or better, there's really no difference between treatments. Um, so, the findings from the study also are not applicable to all cases. Uh, it's a very old study. So a lot of our instruments are better now. Um, our vitrectors are better. Uh, our microscopes, everything is a little bit, you know, more advanced now. Um, they also looked at post cataract endophthalmitis. And as you guys were, you know, you can see this after an intravitreal injection. You can see it after a, a PK, um, after a glaucoma procedure. Um, and then also they excluded NLP patients. So typically, um, the antibiotics that we, our go-tos are going to be vancomycin and ceftazidine. These cover broad spectrum, gram-positive, gram-negative, um, uh, kind of the whole slew of, of bacterial organisms that would typically cause this. Um, if you went the PPV route, the, the advantage there is going to be you can remove the organism, toxins, inflammatory materials, and you can get a really good sample. Um, the disadvantage really is though that you have to have the sophisticated equipment and personnel available. Um, and then also after doing the vitrectomy, the vitreous normally serves as a kind of a reservoir for these antibiotics. So after you clear the vitreous out, a lot of times these antibiotics come out of the eye quicker. Um, and we don't know exactly sort of at what rate, you know, you would re-inject if, if at all, um, that kind of stuff. And you can also, some people do consider injecting intravitreal steroids to kind of modulate the immune response. Um, so the outcomes with this really are going to be limited by if there's an epiretinal membrane, sometimes your macular ischemia um, or macular edema. And it, a lot of the times it's dependent on what organism is causing the endophthalmitis. So 
coag negative staph. So that would be like staph epi, a very common <coughs> in organism. That's going to be your, your, if you had a choice of what organism to take, that's the one you'd want. Um, 20, 100 vision or better in 84% of patients. Highly virulent organisms like staph aureus, strep, pseudomonas are going to be associated with worse outcomes. Uh, and in, in the EBS study, about 50% of so patients achieved the visual acuity of 2040 or better. Um, so decent, you know, decent vision for half. Um, about 75% achieved 2100 or better. 15 were worse or equal to 20, uh, sorry, five over 200. And then five ended up being NLP. The key is going to be their early diagnosis and treatment. You know, you don't want to sit on this. If you see someone um, with any, any signs of severe pain, uh, severe inflammatory reaction, or really anything abnormal after a routine surgery, you want to have a high threshold to, you know, and, and think of this. Um, before I go on, let me ask uh, some of the panelists what experience they have with, um, with, you know, the outcomes after seeing some of these patients in their, in their experience. Uh, let me ask Dr. Brown, you know, just based on the cases you've seen, how do they end up? You know, it's a, a lot of it's luck of the draw. If you get a, uh, a good organism and we catch it fast, I've seen 2020s with no sequelae. On the other hand, if you've got a gram negative bacillus or the patient puts it off for a week, uh, you can lose the entire eyeball. So the key is the world's best antibiotics, which we have in every clinic. You get them to us, we inject quickly, and then luck and prayer what the organism is and how soon they get uh, from, uh, from their symptoms to the antibiotics in their eye. All right. Now, um, Sagar, I'll, I'll just add, you know, you, you mentioned, I think, um, uh, eloquently all the uh, findings of the EVS study and in terms of when we do it and don't do it. And I think one of the other things is in the, in the real world, I think one of the challenges is sometimes um, the view is so hazy um, when, when they're right in the midst of the infection that sometimes it's really hard to get a good view. And so we're trying to judge, um, you know, the safety of actually, imp, you know, putting instruments into the eye in the first place, you know, am I going to do more harm than good by doing it? And so sometimes we'll sit and let the eye cool off a little bit. And then one other tip I, I just throw in there is there are some cases where um, you'll see them very, very early. So before they have the classic signs that, that you had shown, such as the hypopia and such, they had a little bit of inflammation in the eye. But if you, um, if you see uh, a lot of what looks like uh, CRVO in the back of the eye, dot blood hemorrhages and such, then, you know, you can be pretty confident that that's actually going to develop into a full-blown infection. And so you want to be um, kind of very vigilant on those. Um, those are ones that we often want to treat. Okay. Yeah. Well, those are uh, great points. Thank you. Last point. Can I add something here as well, Sagar? Um, I think sort of in our era now, and especially what we deal with, um, we published, you know, a couple of years ago also about a lot of cases that are related to uh, injections, basically oral flora. And so if they have oral flora, there's a much higher risk for a uh, much worse outcome. So those patients, we definitely want to get too quick and be very aggressive with those, sometimes taking them to surgery earlier. Mm -hmm. and, and just uh, one final point, just have to say something from UVI standpoint. Uh, when you see patients with hypopian, um, you know, of course, with history of previous surgery, it's easier. But when you have a fake patient without any history of previous surgery, one, you have to worry about endogenous endophthalmitis. So we have to ask about the fever chills a few days before, and as well as um, not forgetting HLA B27 uveitis causing hypopian. Yeah, those are great points, Dr. Kim, as well, and Dr. Chen. Um, so the other thing that can happen is, and this, this is uh, something you guys may see as well, rather than acute post-operative endophthalmitis, chronic post-operative endophthalmitis. So the, the distinction here is going to be greater than six weeks. Um, usually, though, several weeks to even months after surgery. Um, this is less common, but what will end up happening is, um, you know, a patient will come in, subtle findings, but they may be um, some KPs on the endothelium. You may see um, a white sort of material around the lens capsule, but this is going to typically be caused by a very uh, low virulent organism like a, like P. acnes, staph epi, or even Canada in some cases. Um, and they'll come in typically without any pain. Um, 
and, and inflammation in the AC, you'll find that if you start them on steroids, they actually, the inflammation a lot of times does resolve, um, but then you taper the steroids and it comes right back. Frank hypopion typically is not going to be there, but then you will see this granulonimus uveitis, large precipitates on the cornea or in the IOL. Um, and then typically with P acne, you're going to see this white plaque. So here you can see, you know, there's KPs that you can notice here. Um, and then you can see this white sort of fluffy material kind of everywhere. Um, and this is actually the P acne is growing. Uh, if it's a fungal organism, you know, you, you can start them on steroids and classically you're going to see worsening with the steroids because this will suppress our immune system and the steroid will then kind of have a field day. Um, when you look, you can a lot of times see this stringy white infiltrate. Um, it's called pearls on a string uh, and you're going to pay attention to the capsule. So the key is really to look at the IOL, look at the capsule, you know, kind of look at the surrounding structures and see if you see any sort of material around there. Um, the management here is going to be, you're going to, you need to get, get a sample. Um, AC or vitreous. And then you're going to start with, um, typically if, it's, if you're thinking P acne, you're going to start with, uh, you, you can even start with vancomycin because that's going to really treat it. It's a gram positive organism. Um, but to cover your bases, you could use septazidine as well. Um, and here's, here's a photo of uh, before and after case here. You can see the white sort of material around the capsule. Um, here's a red reflex view. And then afterwards, uh, after a tap and inject, you can see a significant improvement. Um, a lot of times, though, sometimes the nidus will kind of stay in the capsule. And even if you treat with intravitreal antibiotics, you have to, it, it'll recur because it, it's kind of just it's formed this biofilm that is pretty uh, resilient. So you can, a lot of times you have to go back in and remove the actual lens, remove the capsule, um, and then let the eye quiet down for a while before you do anything else. Um is, uh, that's, that's the end of my presentation. Do any of the panelists have any, anything else to add? Thank you, Dr. Patel. We appreciate it. Excellent talk on a scary topic that needs to be seen emergently. So Thank we appreciate you. the end of the Midas update from Dr. Patel. Dr. Shah, are you there ready to, to go? I am ready to go. Let me share my screen here. All right. Um, can you see my screen? Is it showing? All right, um, so we'll go ahead and get started here. So, you know, for my top, I wanna, it's gonna be covering basically when the flow stops, so what happens. And so let's get started. So um, I'll present a few different cases here. Um, the first set of cases, this is a 65 year old male um, that suddenly develops this. You can see uh, basically whitish uh, change in the retina superiorly here, um, along with what looks to be a clot sitting here in the artery. An FA was performed on the early frames of the FA. You can see that there's blockage of the flow posterior to that clot. On the later frames, you can actually see that it does fill in. And so that there is this delayed filling that we see. What you'll notice is this intense um, hyperfluorescence of the clot itself. And so um, those can sometimes be more obvious on fluorescent angiograms. Keep that in mind as well as case two. So you have a 62 year old male who develops this finding right here. Um, so red spot in the center, whitish spot around. Um, and then finally a 45 year old female who develops this um, whitening superior and inferior to the fovea, um, but sparing um, of a central sliver of the macula, which appears to be its normal color. So. When you look at all three of these cases, the question is what went wrong? And basically the flow stopped. And so whenever you have blockage, whether it's a BRAO, CRAO, ciliary retinal artery sparing, which is on this last picture here, um, you can get severe changes in vision um, that you need to address. So just briefly to talk a little bit about retinal artery occlusions as a group, um, their incidence is about one in 100,000. Uh, specifically for CRAO. There's a lot of risk factors that are common to many of their vascular um, uh, retinal pathologies, including smoking, hypertension, uh, BMI, diabetes, hypercholesterolemia, cardiac disease. In terms of uh, percentages, central retinal artery uh, occlusions are about 60%, branch retinal artery occlusions about um, 30%. 
uh, about 38%. And then the retinal artery is the rarity where you have a clot that goes into the retinal artery. Um, and if I can just highlight on the photo, when we talk about retinal artery, its source, you can see the vessel coming off, typically the edge of the, um, um, edge of the disc here. And it's coming from a, it basically has an alternative supply such that a central retinal artery does not occlude it. And so in some cases it can actually save a patient's vision. Uh, we see that as ciliar uh, retinal artery sparing uh, occlusions, uh, central retinal artery occlusions. And that can occur in about 30% of time uh, because 30% of patients do have that ciliar retinal artery. Uh, the mean age is around mid sixties, one in 10,000. Uh, per visit to the eye clinic, men greater than women, and it's bilateral in about one to two percent of cases. In terms of clinical findings, um, some of these you're very familiar with. Both the arteries and the veins are thin. There's box carring, and I'll let me highlight that here. If I kind of magnify this, you can see it looks like train uh, uh, train box cars um, because you have pooling in the blood column. Embolus is seen in about twenty percent of these cases, and often cholesterol or Hollenhorst plaques can be uh, visualized. Um, cherry red spot is the most predominant feature specifically for a central retinal artery occlusion where you see um, kind of the red center with a whitening outside. So here is a photo on the right of a cherry red spot. On the left, um, you have another photo. Uh, looks very similar, and that is in fact because it is, but it accounts for ethnicity. So um, don't be fooled into cherry red spots got to be red. It varies as um, ethnicity does because what you're seeing is some of the pigmentation uh, from the, the layers below. So um, there's a lot of different treatments that are tried for this. So you see a patient like this, um, uh, they get referred over right away because these are concerning, and I'll kind of talk about some of the reasons why in a moment here. And so they're in the retina specialist office. And then these are the list of possible treatments for central retinal artery, artery occlusion, IV acetazolamide, IV mannitol, topical uh, anti-glaucoma medications, um, carbogen, um, among others, TPA, hyperbaric oxygen, surgical procedures such as AC paracentesis, ocular massage, YAG, parsplane of vitrectomy have been tried. And so I will briefly just kind of toss it to the uh, panel and just ask, has anyone tried any of these and have any of them worked um, uh, for you? Encore, I do, I do usually do at least um, ocular massage, but I can't say it's ever worked. I've probably done 10 paracentesis and it's never worked. So. I usually put them on pressure drops at least. And then um, one other thing that can be treatable as I always act, ask about GCA symptoms. So um, I always ask about temporal pain or jaw claudication. If they have GCA symptoms and you get them on steroids, that, that can be treatable. Exactly. And, and that, that's a great point. I, I found myself, I've used um, ocular massage and I've used, what I tend to do is uh, put bromonidine on uh, for neuroprotection plus IOP lowering. So the idea is if we lower the pressure in the eye, maybe it, the clock kind of nudges a little further downstream. And so potentially they can recoup some of the blood flow. But again, we try these. Uh, I've seen it work once on a BRAO, but I'm not convinced that it was me that did anything. It might've just been the edema that kind of receded from the macula. So, um, so that's um, one of the findings. And as you know, the general statement is in medicine, I think if you find yourself throwing the kitchen sink at a problem, um, it basically means you have no treatment that works well. And so that's kind of the case. So we try these things. And I think sometimes that often leads to physicians and healthcare providers feeling kind of like this as well, because you're trying whatever you can for this patient. And a lot of times it may not have um, an impact. So some evidence-based recommendations. So in the short term, um, urgent medical evaluation at a level one stroke center. So this is underdone and something that should be done. And if my one statistic that I'd love for folks to take away is that there is a 3.37 greater risk of stroke, um, cerebral stroke um, um, in the 30 days post diagnosis. So even if they had no other issues up until then, they come in with an artery occlusion, they are at a greater than threefold risk um, of having issues. I'll, 
I'm going to pick on some folks here. Um, uh, Charlie, uh, if you're there, I'm going to pick on you. You seem to, you always have great stats. Is there one stat that you like to throw out to CRAO or BRA patients? Uh, yes, yeah, sure, I'll give you a shout. I guess to back up a second from my perspective, you know, the images you show and, and for our colleagues out there that are tuning in, are the images that the Dr. Shaw is showing are beautiful and the diagnosis is obvious. But this is much more challenging when you're seeing a patient kind of on the fly, the hazy view, they have a little cataract, PCO, there's not a typical chair red spot, it was two or three days ago, their hand motion. It, it, it can be a subtle diagnosis uh, remarkably because all the images you'll ever see in textbooks are so classic. But a lot of these are a lot more subtle. So the diagnosis is to keep on your radar when there's unexplained vision loss. And it can be even relatively mild vision loss with a DRAO or it can even be preserved vision. So, so be careful about this diagnosis. I think the GTA comment is probably the most important one that I would put out there also. If they're over 50 is what all the textbooks say, you really got to think about GCA and document that you've thought about GCA because that, that, that can turn into a black bilateral blinding disease quickly. I guess, you know, once you've ruled out all the bad stuff, maybe the number I would leave people with is, is probably 10 to 20% risk of, of neovascularization, potentially NVG. So even though the prognosis here is bad, a lot of people don't get vision back. It's so frustrating that they don't, but you really have to follow them because it can get worse even when they have a bad outcome. They need long-term follow-up. That's a great point. And, and you know, you heard um, both Dr. Henry and Dr. Wyckoff talk about Janssel arteritis. So you want to identify and prevent um, uh, and treat the life-threatening conditions. So stroke um, present in up to 25% of patients um, that's, you know, that are presenting with this. And it's, um, and as I suggested or, or pointed out, it's a high probability of occurring in that immediate post uh, occlusion period. Uh, giant cell arteritis, looking at labs such as ESR, CRP, platelets, um, uh, among uh, clinical signs uh, such as uh, those mentioned by Dr. Henry earlier. And then aggressive autoimmune conditions can also mimic this, especially if you're getting multiple um, BRAOs. Um, but that's something that certainly we'd, we'd be looking for very carefully because those can have other issues. And then to, to Dr. Wyckoff's point about the long-term issues, you know, that, that number of 10 to 20% of knowing that you can have secondary sequela of issues such as neovascular glaucoma, where you have maybe count fingers or hand motion vision, but that can go to NLP. And so that is require it does require ongoing follow-up. Um, so in terms of the current RECs, this is what we tend to do is we will send out patients with this um, form. A lot of times we really just highlight the risk for emergency emergent stroke and we get them to a level one trauma center. Uh, we will typically have them um, order in a carotid ultrasound, echocardiogram, neuroimaging, preferably a DW MRI. Um, those are some of the tests that we like to do in addition to some of the lab work we talked about to rule out GCA, especially if there's concern. Um, uh, and with that, in the interest of time, I'll wrap it up. And if there's any questions in the chat, happy to address any of those. Thanks for tuning in, guys. All right, I've turned it over. I'm picking it up here. Thank you very much, Dr. Shaw. That was excellent. BRAO, CRAO topic. <clears throat> so um, let's see here. I'm getting to the end. Yeah, I've got a question for Encore, that's all right. I think yeah. there, there was a great question on the thread, which I think is a tough one to answer, but it was, the question was from Dr. Wen, should this patient be referred to retina or PCP or cardio, and I would add, or ER, um, uh, when they have the diagnosis? It's sort of a challenging question. What do you, what do you think, Encore? Where should the patient actually go? Yeah, so... Um... The answer varies depending on what you're seeing. So if, if you're confident in the diagnosis and it's definitely a CRAO, then um, we, what we do is we, we send to an emergency room and um, there's good evidence to now support that. That's been a sea change from what used to happen, which is you would have these tests done on a one to two week basis and it can be done at the, with their PCP or the cardiologist. But now we really do rush to try to get that done because there is good evidence that they've either had a stroke or high risk of developing a stroke. Um, so that's what, you know, what I would suggest. I did see another question about BRAO and the risk. And it's interesting, there, there's stats out there with a CRAO, you have about a 40% chance of having carotid disease or stenosis with the BRAO about 10%. Um, if I extrapolate from there, and you always get in trouble when you extrapolate, but, but that would, you know, estimate that there is 
a, a certain stroke risk level um, just from a BRAO, not just um, those that are having uh, CRAOs. So in all of these, these are kind of heightened and more emergent scenarios uh, that we do want to uh, treat. So the ER uh, can be a very valuable tool uh, once you've confirmed the diagnosis. And so, and that choice of ER is really tough because that diffusion weighted DWI MRI isn't very common and it's about a $3,000 test. And so you really got to send them to a level one stroke center. A lot of times we have a hard time getting them to the right place because they'll go to their local, you know, we say St. Luke's Woodlands and they'll go to the St. Luke's Woodlands dock in the box in the mall or whatever. So you almost got it. We give them on the back of our sheet and you're welcome to talk to Sarah and get our sheets. We're okay with you using them. But the addresses of the level one stroke center, if you have a positive DWI MRI, which you have a one out of four chance if you have a CRAO. And if you have a positive, you have up to a 70% chance of having a major stroke in the next week. And that's why those patients get the MRI that night. If they're positive, they're admitted, they're usually uh, anticoagulated. It's a big deal. Uh, and so we're happy to see these patients to take them off your hands. Uh, on the other hand, if you have a very educated, good patient and they will go to one of these and say, I've got a central retinal artery occlusion and get the workup, you can save their life. I think yeah, if, you do, if you do send to the ER, I'd make sure that you give them your cell phone number because oftentimes the ER doctor will want to talk to you directly in the process. It will definitely expedite it for the patient. So, so to answer, Char Charlie, to answer your question, I mean, if somebody's calling at three o'clock in the afternoon and they, they're confident that it's a CRAO or BRO, um, should they come see you or should they go to the go see, go to the stroke center? I would say go to the stroke center um, because what you're following for, if you're sure that it's a CRAO, is that they have a higher incidence of MVG. And, that, and it's not a 90-day MVG like CRVO. It's more like a, a four-week um one month MVG. And usually if they can get out after three months and don't have a um, have MVI MVG, they're not likely to fall in artery obstruction. But they're, they're at uh, risk for um, uh, vascular glaucoma earlier on. But, you know, we're not going to do anything for their, um, their condition. So if they can get it, if it's late in the afternoon, they're better off probably going to the stroke center. I think in terms of when you counsel these patients, it's helpful to, instead of kind of focusing on the fact that there's not a lot we can do for the eye, which is kind of depressing, to focus on, you know, the good news that you're seeing them and that we can get them to the ER and potentially prevent a major brain stroke. And it kind of turns the paradigm around from being like, we have nothing to offer you to, this could be a sign of something worse happening and we're going to potentially save your life by sending you to the ER. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That just makes the, the, the interaction better for the patient um, because... Yeah. As Ankur said years ago, we, we, that wasn't the paradigm. And then all we would say is like, we can't do anything for the eye. And it was really tough for both the provider and the patient. And let's not forget the carotid dissection. You know, I mean, that especially when you see multiple plaques, I always have to remember carotid dissections as well. Thank you all. And again, if you want a list of this comprehensive level one stroke centers that can run and get a diffusion weighted MRI, we're happy to give you this list here. We, uh, Sarah can provide you, just ask us for us. We can give you that list. So we'll Sarah, wrap it up. Email it to everybody after the meeting. Yeah, perfect. We'll wrap it up. Um, so again, you know, in terms of, Hung, can you advance the slide one? There. So how to contact Redden Consultants, Texas. Obviously there's a 24 seven emergency room uh, physician on call number. That's 713-524-3434. You can refer online at Retina Consultants of Texas, and you see the picture of the page there, which is easy, and then also fax a referral. If it's something more urgent, maybe do not fax it, but please call or refer online. We'll probably get to it faster if you're more concerned. And next slide. And y'all are wondering, well, how do I get my CE credit for tonight? And you are eligible for one therapeutic hour um, to the Texas Optometry Board. Uh, so please contact Sarah Barbatano. And if you registered on the Zoom, you're all set. We submit it for you. Is that correct, Sarah? You're done. If you registered, we're done. If not, please contact Sarah Barbatano, who can answer your questions at the bottom there. Also, mark your calendar. Our next C event like this, different topics, of course, and different doctors. Mark it down April 14th. Uh, so about six weeks away. April 14th is our next CE. 
thank you so much for participating. I hope everyone did well in the storm. I hope you learned a lot tonight. And we really appreciate the confidence you give us in taking care of your patients. Thank you so much.